make sure that you still achieve your potential and your purpose, whether you're single or married. And a lot of the questions that she gets is really around, I'm a married person, and it just feels like my life has paused since I got married. So, we have two incredible couples here today, and I have great pleasure of moderating. I've been married for all of two minutes, so <laughs> this is very important. It's not by accident that I'm the one moderating this panel. I pray to the Lord that we did it. Um, and so we have these two amazing couples. One has been married for 32 years, so they are veterans, yes. And another has been married for less than 10 years, but they are closer to a lot of people in this room. So if you know that you want to extract value from them, you know how to do it. You give them a rousing what? Ovation. So, join us now. Welcome, Mr. and Mrs. Shade and Fadeke Adekatu. Commitment for better for worse. 
So the success is based on the ability to actually carry out that commitment that you made to the beginning of the marriage. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, if you want to clap, clap. <laughs> uh, I'm still going to stick with both of you before we move on. Um, so you've talked about understanding that it's the process and really making a commitment and following through on that commitment. I would also want you, as you now you know, open up and tell us your story, to also help us, think, as you tell your story, can you give us the principles that have helped you? Because the, the times are different, but principles are timeless. So yes, I know we are Gen Z and we are millennials and it's a different time and it's a different kind of crazy that we are dealing with now. But the principles that have helped in the past can also continue to help us now. So we want you to share those principles with, principles with us as you share your story um, of how you guys have made it this far. Um, I will go to the foundational aspect of what, of, of what a marriage is. And I think it's, it's, it's um, embodied in the marriage vows that you take on the day you get married. Most people will take those vows. Um, and you take them before God and you take them before man, but they are very significant. It's the line and that the time people are getting married, they're looking into each other's eyes and everybody in the church is going, ooh and ah and how lovely and when they announce the newest couple in town, everybody's clapping and some women are crying, some men are, you know, everybody is so emotional. It's, it really is surreal at that point in time. You could get, but, but what do they say to each other? And Significant to say that. What does it mean when you say to be my I shall I take thee by the again to be my wedded wife to have and to hold from this day forward? Let me pause there. It's for the rest of your life. For the rest of your life. Whatever it is, once and all, you will see and hear and feel till death do you pass. There's no, that's supposed to be what the power is. So and then you go on and say, for richer, for poorer, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, it doesn't matter, you continue. In sickness and in health, those are the ones that say life happens. You got married, both of you healthy, both of you strong and viral, and then something happens to one of you. Do you continue with the same intensity and the same sort of passion that you had at the beginning? Can you do it? What does it take to do it? And to love and to cherish till death do us part. According to God's holy ordinance, and therefore I pledge the, my faith and I pledge myself to you. So I said that 32 years ago. I did not get that date wrong. If I got that date wrong and I said 33 or 31 or 30, I could be in trouble. So you know, you've got to understand how these things work. So, so we said that so many years ago, but it rings continuously it's fundamental. It never changes. Those are the essential things, I would say. Just keep into those vows. That's my view. I think I'm sure my dear wife will have something to add. Look, also, another important thing that this is also the symbols of the that it is extremely important that you marry your friend. You must marry your friend. I've known my husband for 40 years because we dated eight years ago. I don't want to tell you how old I was when I was when I when he decided to date him. Because I tell my daughter that she was at the time, she, she, I had no business having a boyfriend. It was wrong. Anyway. <laughs> I was still wrong. But the age has helped. The age has helped because he had some time to know about my family background because I came from a very dysfunctional background. So he, had, he understood and it helped. But then some people may not, may not have the luxury of time anymore. If you do not have the luxury of time, you must marry your friend. Don't settle. Because one day the kids are going to go. Things are going to happen. But if you marry your friend, that friendship is what is a relationship when those suddenness so for me, friendship is key. I just need to add this, please. She was only 17. <laughs> Why is she 
most money your friends. <laughs> and I, I was only 19. So I've known my dear loving wife for practically all my life. Lupus. I'm sure for most of you what lupus is, 
Lupus is an autoimmune disease that attacks the good organs in your body. And also high diabetes. So the medication for treating the lupus means that it's worse. So it's a catch-22. Anyway, I was lingering for about a few weeks, a few months. Now, regarding the diabetes, I don't have a sweet tooth. I need all those things. The only one thing that I do know I cannot do without was to do. So I asked the um great which is the diabetes, the, the guy. I said, I've never had ever been treated that cured of diabetes. He said, No, we can manage it, blah blah blah. I said, I'm doing that first person. And I faced my God. I said, Father, for the sake of Dudu, please take away this diabetes. And guess what? I got back to Nigeria and I kept on having disease spots. And one day the doctor said, Stop that insulin. It was November 11. Time up. You are kidding me. <laughs> anyway, so I had over the over the years I had that because it was lupus, it was affecting two different organs. I found my lungs, not fibrosis, I had tuberculosis. Now this tuberculosis was 2008. So after this session, please don't move away from me. It was 2008. I do not have that this <laughs> So I've had all kinds of challenges, health challenges over the years, and that's why I wrote that book. And so now the important thing was that days also had breast, I had breast cancer scan. So each time we would go to the hospital, and my husband would know what it was that would come out with, or what it is. There was an impression I had when I had to be had to raise our experience which was against me. And but he stood there. There was one I couldn't pray. He thought I would pray. And as I said, something is what happens when a spouse falls sick? Some people have had lupus, I had an identity. It may not be you, it may be a child. Maybe that the husband lost his job or the wife lost his job. That is the test of the marriage. And that's what people feel. It's not because I'm better than most people. It's just that God gave me a solid husband. And it's just <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll start speaking uh, 
funny thing is we didn't have we didn't have any hashtags for our wedding. Um, I was the worst bride in the world because I I always told everybody I don't care about the cake. I don't care about the food. I don't really care about. We had a wedding planner. And she's like, do you want cream or white? I was like, please, please. I don't. I don't care. As long as I'm marrying the person who I actually care about. As long as we're on the right foot for the wedding itself. Everything else is just a party, and we'll move on with our lives. But let me rewind back to how we. I guess how we started. How we met. Um, there's a lot of planning, so I'll say one big thing for us as a dual career couple is around planning. And I would say planning even before you begin your marriage. Um, me, as I am an introvert, I'm a strong introvert, I am very, very happy by myself. And I think that a lot of single ladies, a lot of single people in general, need to get to a place where you are very content with yourself. I spent 20, 20, 24, 24 years understanding myself, 24 years knowing what type of person I wanted to be, 24 years determining what are my values and what's most important to me. And the only thing that, and a strong idea of what I wanted to do in my career, not being perfect, but a strong idea. And I'm only going to get married to somebody who's adding value to that, to the person I already am. So when I bumped into him, well, I didn't bump into him, he, he actually ignored my Facebook message when I first messaged him. She bumped into me. <laughs> Um, but that's another story. On, I think our first, on a, our first date, I sat down and I told him what it is I wanted to do. Um, I was I was applying to the PhD program at the Harvard Business School. He was an MBA student. Um, he was the only person I knew because he was friends with my sister. So we sat down and we're just having a conversation. And I'm telling him, oh yes, I want to do healthcare. And I'm trying to revolutionize the healthcare system across Africa. And he's telling me his plans. And I'm going deeper and deeper into my plans. And when I finished speaking on what it is I want to do, this man looks at me. A good answer would have been, that's great. You, you really can do it. That, that's really what you should be doing. But what he said was, I think you can do so much more. He's like, you're selling yourself short. The way you talk about things, the way you think about things, you know, you can actually do 10 times more. And I was like, wow. Was it toasting you there? I'm telling you, if he knew what to say, you know, he knew the right thing to say. But that's the type of person you want to be with. Somebody who's looking at you and not just seeing you as you see yourself. Seeing you the way God sees you. Seeing you ten times better than you can ever believe in yourself. Because the way I believe in myself, sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm not good enough for this. And your partner needs to believe in you being so much better than you can even ever imagine yourself. Because that's the person who will push you to do ten times more. Sometimes he's telling me, oh, he thinks of this, he thinks of that, and I'm like, ha, hey, they want nonsense. You are going to do X, Y, and Z. Forget this, this is what you're going to do. And that's the type of support. So we plan things. He knew very well from the beginning what I, what I planned for us, what he and I were planning together. So that once we started the marriage, every, I say every two or three years, we sit down, we talk to each other. Okay, what do you think of this? Okay, this makes sense. All right, we have a plan for our long-term marriage. Because, you know, it's a partnership. It's Kaede kind of and Chini Incorporated. This is going to be a company that goes for the long term. But every few years, you have to have your company plan. You set your company budget. You set your company goals and, and values and all of that. And we sit together and we talk about it. But we don't just talk about it haphazardly. We set the time apart to talk about these things. Every day, probably today, we'll sit home. The kids, you know, the children, they have their own dinner. And you don't want to spend your whole dinner fussing and fighting with the children to get them to eat. They have their dinner, and then we have our own dinner afterwards where we sit down and we're talking. I'm telling him about my day, he's telling me about his day, because you have to be intentional about sharing this information. Yeah. We'll never have a combined plan as a couple if he's over there doing his thing and I have no idea what's happening, and I'm over here doing my thing and he has no idea what's happening. But at the same time, all of this only works because we have a clear understanding that each person has the best interest of the other person in heart. If he tells me something that I don't like, I'm not going to feel, I might not like it, but in my gut, I know that he does, he's doing it because he loves me, he's doing it because he wants my best interest at heart, and even if I don't want to hear it, it's something I need to hear. Now imagine if he says something and I'm, I'm not too sure of the trust, I'm not too sure of the love, because there's some couples who are like that, and I'm like, okay, maybe he's jealous of me becoming too big or something, but never. That's never been the case because we have these discussions and we're clear about 
what we both want individually and collectively. So anytime he's saying something to me, you know, I can, I can be stubborn. Anytime he's saying something to me, and even if I'm stubborn, I'm like, oh, but you know he's right. Because he's saying this from a place of love. And so we plan, um, we, we, we go back to our plan. Even if the plan changes along the way, we at least have a plan as a guiding compass. Thank you, Chair. Hi, this is you not that I do not allow you to talk. Oh, um, first of all, you know, thank you so much for your you know, earlier comments and sort of this, you know, your plan you have after hearing from you know, 33 years you know, and more of marriage is something that you know, we also appreciate here. Oh, sorry, I'm just getting over a cold. So, um, you know, excuse me if my voice is a bit low. Okay. Um, but I'm just thanking, um, the, you know, the, the different students for their, you know, candid, um, uh, you know, feedback and sort of marriage and their experience. Um, in, in the case of Chinny and me, um, I like to say that um, we've been married for six years, but dating for ten, and um, and I think that's important. Um, that it's marriage, you know, should also be fun. You know, it is also a merger of hopefully equals. Um, but you know, when we're doing our wedding vows, and it's the same type of scene you described, and I, I was just thinking of myself. I leaned over to uh, all these people, this whole scene of families and relatives from continents around the world have flown in. We're in Long Island, nice country club, gates crash for us a little bit. I said to her, "Okay, this wedding thing, eh? don't worry, you're still my girlfriend." I just started laughing. <laughs> And, and the reverend just kind of looking at us, so what are these two laughing about? Should be very serious. Um, and, and I think that's one thing that's been important to us, um, that there is a bit of laughter. And, you know, and for our children, um, I think one time um, the teacher had asked the nanny, what goes on inside that house? These children are always laughing and smiling. <laughs> um, and he said, no, the parents, what do they do? So they just talk and laugh and they, they talk a lot. Um, so it's it just interesting, and hearing that is something that I think is important. So you know, we have dinner together, which was in terms of value, something that she doesn't necessarily, didn't necessarily do beforehand. Uh, you know, dinner as an institution, something that I insisted on, um, quite frankly. That said, at least we can connect. We're both very busy. I um, mean, there've been times when I think there was one instance where. I was flying from New York to London. Chini was flying from South Africa somewhere. We had one child in New York with the grandparents. Another one was, you know, with with uh, one of the aunties. And so we had like, you know, four people, one family, on four different countries, <laughs> on three different continents. It's crazy. So at some point, you need to make sure you have a form in which you can also speak, talk, and it happens consistently. And those are the rules. Um, so we're going home to dinner tonight, and you know, we'll we'll talk about the, the how the the rest of the. the um, so, so in terms of you know our story and, and that background, that that's been a fundamental thing. And it began really that first date, just having these conversations about what do you value, what do you care about, and um, you know what do you see in the future. Um, you know, yes, I was toasting her, but it's also you know one of those things. Also, at that point in time, I'd also kind of decided myself that you know at that point in time, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was dating intentionally, and I was looking to meet somebody who I thought we could build a future and a family. So it was, it was something that, um, that was uh, quite you know, important. And then making decisions, whether it is to move to Nigeria, whether it is to go from Abuja to Lagos, um, whether to start the business, whether to start two businesses, um, you know, children, how you set up your home, how you set up everything. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Diane. So you talked about, I know both of you are incredibly busy. Um, one thing that a lot of people and a lot of women um, take, they make that decision implicitly to say if we're both busy and we start having kids, it's okay when you're a power couple and there are no children involved. Are you, do you agree with me? You can both be anywhere, you Skype, you, you know, life is good. You can go Monday to Thursday to Abuja and come back on the weekend and life is good. It's fun, it's exciting. The moment you have children, you know, the dynamic changes and the default um, response to that is that the woman takes the back seat and decides, sometimes they don't even have the conversation. The woman just assumes that it's her duty to take that back seat and um, be the primary caregiver at home. I know that that's not the situation with both of you. Um, and so I want you to be you know, very uh, honest and candid about how you made the decision about how do you approach parenting. 
because it's important that you're present, right? So talking about that, and also what the role of the support system around you has been in making sure that you, I mean, maybe we, I, we don't know whether you took a vaccine, you have to tell us, you know, but how have you continued to, you know, push your careers and your businesses despite having children? Because Mr. Oshika opened to say, today is about, I will do X, Y, Z, despite the situation in my life. So please share, share on that. And we have, the time is up for you. Just share very quickly on that, and then we'll go into the Q&A. So how have you been deliberate about parenting and not sacrificing your individual careers? You know, on the uh, parenting, I think you may have more experience you know, on this over time. But in, in our case, um, the, I'll make a small comment, and Chini will really give the extended commentary. Is that, um, you know, Chini has two older sisters um, who are very accomplished, one of whom was actually a classmate of mine, um, and I, long before I met Chini. And um, they have husbands who are also professionals and we have situations where they're all professionals, all working at the highest, you know, surgeons, doctors, a whole bit. And um, I remember when I, after I proposed to Ginny, um, uh, oldest brother was an investment banker in New York, we all got together, the guys, we became friendly. And, um, you know, we, we, we call him, so maybe he's the head brother, and we, we even go out to steak dinners together, we spend time, and he says, you know, these um, ladies that we're married or marrying are very special. Um, they're career people, and have extraordinary potential, and it's something we all saw. So, you know, part of it is, is, is really our job to make sure that they can um, achieve that and what achieve what their dreams are to the highest level. So don't just become a, don't do your MBA, do your PhD, don't become an eye doctor, become a retinal surgeon. And these are intentional decisions. And and, and I think you know, inside of the, the men in terms of family, that's something that we have a fair bit of leverage. I'll say in terms of being able to provide that support or, you know, figuring out how that works. Um, so that's just, you know, brief what I'd say, but something that we, that we decided, um, you know, even outside of just us, but also just in the larger family network that we said, look, let's figure out how does this work. And then we meet for our state dinners every year and see how we're doing, actually. Actually, you tell us how it's being I'm asking for a friend. So, so I'm going to start. I'm going to talk a bit about um, us leveraging each other, and then I'll go into details of, of around the children. So before the kids came, um, we have one of our friends, Acha, Acha Leke. Um, you know, we, we visit him at his home every now and then, and doing one of those visits, he just intentionally said, you guys need to leverage each other much better than you currently do. Um, because he's seen, I mean, he's seen a lot of different things, and I think one thing that um, my husband, one thing that my, my brothers-in-law have been able to do very, very well for themselves is, is simply tell them, we feel that this is something that would be good for you to do, right? So if he goes somewhere, let's say he's at some high-level meeting with some, you know, world-leading X, Y, and Z, and they happen to talk about healthcare, or they happen to talk about hospitals, or they happen to talk about something that might even remotely be related to me, He'll say, oh, I know somebody who's perfect for that. I'll send you an introduction. And he very quickly sends an email introduction. This man will forward me um, fellowships. He'll forward me articles. If he knows of any new deals that might even remotely be relevant for my work, he'll send it to me immediately. So it's kind of like a history of doing that. And we've been running you know, together, running this race, running this race together for a long time. But then the children come. And you can't just be running the race blindly, especially for women. Because the truth of the matter is, things change like significantly. And for a while there, when you're pregnant, and when you're nursing, and when your children are quite young, things just have to slow down. Like they very, very, they, they don't come to a halt, but they very, very much have to slow down. And when I was pregnant, I had luckily um, easy pregnancies, but before I carried all the way through, we had two miscarriages. Um, I was running around the world doing all sorts of things, and I, mean, I know a number of other women who've had miscarriages, but we had very devastating miscarriages because, like in my family, I had, I had never heard of anybody who had a miscarriage. My mom didn't have one, my sisters didn't have one, it just wasn't something I thought was happening. So I put a lot of blame on myself, like, oh my God, what am I doing wrong? And then we had the children, and the kids, you know, we, we have a wonderful support system of nannies, yes, um, and also aunties and uncles, so that if he and I, we, we definitely do our best to see that um, one parent is always there at every single point in time. But if it ever happens that he and I are both not there, they have aunts, they have grandparents, they have people who are around to support. But I think that one thing that, that 
really, really important for us to always remember is that your children, you have to nurture them as much as you can, but at some point in time, it's always with the understanding that it's going to be you and your spouse at the end of the day. It was said before, the children are going to go off and do their own thing. So we want to make sure that we're taking time out. Yes, we're focusing on the kids. We're focusing on their, their education. Like he, he's, he is obsessed with Excel spreadsheets and he has their education for the next 15 years on his spreadsheet. I kid you not. 18 <laughs> years. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the type of thing that he does. You know, we, we are in some way vegan yet. We haven't gotten to the level where we fuse together yet. He and I are very, very different people. You know, I'm quite, I come from a very loud, very like, eccentric family. He comes from a rather conservative family, so sometimes I'll do some things and he'll be like, listen, you need to chill out. And it, it comes out when you raise children, you really realize that the things that you have as a family, like your own core family values, they come out when you're raising children. And sometimes that may cause friction. And you have to talk about those things. He mentions the dinner thing. My family, where we came from, my mom would be coming home from the hospital while my other sister is going to school, while I'm going for a track meet. And we would all just eat whenever. I would eat snacks, I would eat whatever, I might not even have dinner, it just wasn't a big deal to me. His family, every single day, at 6, is it 6.30? At 6.30 p.m., formal dinner, napkin, plate, the, the, the pork and milk, I'm just like that. And they all come downstairs in the formal attire, bell ring, I'm not even joking, the bell will ring and they'll do dinner time. And the first time it happened, I was like, he <laughs> I was literally like, what is this? Because it didn't even occur to me that people actually did that outside of what happened on TV. <laughs> you were the first dinner at your parents' house. No, he thought we were heathens. He thought we were some sort of like rugged, crazy, people just going out into like the you know, nature, crunchy eating with their fingers. This man will eat pizza with a fork and knife. <laughs> Tightness. 
how do you convince like an ego and person to your how do you deal with that dynamic? Especially if you've never had anyone like from another tribe marry someone in your family. Thank you. Thank you. And this Good evening, my name is Ulwa Toy. So my question is for the adequate. Um, the Ogunos met when they were accomplished, they knew themselves, so they knew what they were looking for. But the adequate met when they were 17 and 19, and they always say you need to know who you are before you get married. So how could you possibly have known yourself at 17 and 19, and also who you are before? So who you are at 24 is not who you are at 29. So how do you get married at 29, knowing that you could still evolve at 25? So we have one last. Yes, um, I think. Please round of applause for the first gentleman asking a question today. the real real you have to give the real deal here um we're we're very similar in our values but we're also very different in how we process information so i am a very practical very sensible give me the data and i'll make my decision from there and he's more of like a guts emotional this is you know this is what makes sense um this year i'm going to talk about forgiveness this year has been very difficult if anybody follows me on instagram at Chiniko, at Chinico. Um, I, I haven't talked too much about our daughter, our older daughter, um, Adira Dara. She, she, was, she was quite ill, she was extremely ill earlier this year, um, and we had to emergency fly out to the US um, in, in March. So the entire month of March, we spent in the hospital uh, just treating her, praying over her, and it wasn't, it was something that, yes, it happened rapidly, but you know, as a couple, you have to make the decision of when do you take your child out? And I think I, he's, he's very conservative and I'm very, um, I'm very, uh, yes. So he, you know, day one, let's get out, let's fly, let's fly, let's move. And I was like, ah, no, wait, am I not in healthcare in Nigeria? Just let's, let's get the information, let's get the data, let's see what's happening, let's go to the labs. 
And if the doctor that I trust is telling me, you know, don't worry, manage it at home, then I'm like, okay, okay, love, we're okay. Don't worry, let's manage it at home. And he's like, oh, we need to move. And I'm like, no, no, let's manage it at home. Is it not my child? Um, and I made a mistake, you know, as a mother. I waited too long because I wanted to believe in the system here. And my husband was like, we need to fly tomorrow. We need to fly right now. We need to leave. And I was like, both of us are making the decision. Let's wait. I waited too long. If we had waited even a few more hours, because once we landed in New York, we went straight to the emergency room because my, my parents met us. My mom's a, a, a neonatologist. She looked at our child and she was just like, my God, straight to the hospital. So we went straight to the hospital. They're like, oh my God, straight into the bed. And from there was the entire month. I made a, I made a mistake. And it's a critical mistake, you know. Thank God she's alive, she's doing well, everything is fine. But at the end of the day, I made a mistake. And he could have, he could have been like, ah, Chini, you waited till, he could have from then till today been angry with me for toying, toying with our child's lives. You get what I mean? But if you love the person, and not even just if you love the person, you're in it for the other person's best good. He didn't use it, and he doesn't, he doesn't even bring it up. He's, he's barely even brought it up. It's me bringing it up now. He's never said, well, you made the mistake of X, Y, and Z. We both use it as a learning experience. What could we have done better? How could we have, Chinny, how could you have not been too stubborn to see this? How could we have communicated even better than we already do? What sorts of decisions, where were the decisions that were made incorrectly? What can we do better together in the future? And that process has made us so, such better, much better parents. It has made us a much better couple. It has, it has, it has strengthened, obviously, our resolve in God and our religion. Because, you know, we individually prayed. Each, I would pray, uh, he would pray, he'll do his prayer. But when something happens to your child like that, you pray together as a couple in, in a whole different way. So forgiveness. And forgiveness without me having to come and beg on my knees and say, I'm so sorry, I did something. And even the fact that I'm able to say, you know what, I made a mistake. I own up to the fact that I made a mistake. I don't know everything in the world. We should have gone when you, even before you first said we should have gone, we should have gone. And that's part of marriage. Thank you, Chini. Uh, just very quickly, 30 seconds on inter... Oh. Tribal, iteration, inter... inter well, let me tell that. that, bit. that so that, that's an interesting uh, question. So my name is Kaido Guru. <laughs> she is Chini Ofo. In um, my case, um, my father is Nigerian, but my mom is actually from Ghana. Um, so you know, what's interesting is that my family is very, very diverse. Um, so so my, my dad actually grew up mostly in the UK. Um, my mom is Ghanaian. My other uncle married Ethiopian, Ghanaian. One didn't get married. So we have sort of a United Nations <laughs> in some ways. And so, you know, then I come back with, it doesn't, you're about, it didn't matter, oh, even a Nigerian. My dad was like, okay. He said, he said to me, so, you don't feel like you need to marry a Nigerian. You know, we don't care. It was literally just the, the feedback. There's no zero um, interest, you know, in that question at all. Chini, um, on your side? On my side, it's funny because my, um, my immediate family, right, my parents, my mom and dad, They've always, for a long time, they've taught us that it's about the person and not about the tribe or the religion or anything like that. If, you if you're blessed and lucky enough to find somebody you even like in this world, somebody who can be your friend, explore it. Do you get what I mean? So, I mean, I think my, my sisters and I, we grew up in Long Island, New York. We were born here. We, we left when we were about 10 years old. But we grew up in Long Island, New York. So my parents have seen uh, Oibo Oibo. My parents have seen Spanish. My parents have seen uh, Asian. My parents have seen everything. And they're just like, oh, ha, ah, he's Nigerian. We thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Let me add this a bit. So, so, so one interesting thing about that in terms of maybe getting to the question about sort of, you know, intertribal marriage in Nigeria is that, so Chini's grandmother, Mama Nuku, um, we're having dinner at the parents' house, and she says, Oguro, I used to know one Oguro. I was like, oh, please, God, let not have been <laughs> some story. So he says, yeah, during the war, um, we lost everything. Um, we, the family lived in Lagos. Um, so Chini's mother, was born, Chini's mother was born in Lagos. Family lived in Lagos, lost everything during the, the Civil War. Um, and she says, when we came back to Lagos, we went to a lawyer. It says, there was one Oguro that in, in an office in Yaba, and I was a young girl, went to go and see that man. 
and he represented us, and he actually sued the Nigerian government and won a settlement. And so they, she kept going and said, oh, mama, you're just talking, you're talking. She says, no, hold on, let me talk. And, um, and it was okay. I said, oh, that's, that's actually my grandfather and my dad's senior brother um, who were there. And, you know, my dad said, yeah, you know, grandpa used to do those types of things, you know, sue government and so forth. And so, um, and so she said, well, you know, so consider the bride price paid. <laughs> Chini's father had other ideas. But, the, but that was an important um, gap closer, I would say. Sorry, I'll, I'll add one last thing. Um, we actually had a lot more pushback from the larger community as opposed to our immediate family. So my immediate family, his immediate family, everybody's supportive, but it's, you know, aunties, uncles, cousins, everybody who has an opinion on, ah, you're marrying a Yoruba boy, you're marrying this and that. Random people who you don't even know, who you went to school with their their brother will now come to you and say, oh, but you know, ah, your man, okay, he's here about, it's okay, you tried. And it's like, you can either focus on the negative or you can focus on the positive and the people who do support you. And even the people who don't support you, are they the ones in the marriage? Honestly, it's your own marriage. It's how happy are you? The people who are, who are um, having opinions and saying negative things, let them face their marriage however they want to. You face your own marriage, face your own relationship, and we'll see what happens to everybody in the end. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to go over to our veterans for the last 4.2 minutes that we have. <laughs> um, for people who are already uh, in marriages that are not ideal, for people who made the mistake of not marrying their friends, for people who, you know, for some reason have not managed to fused together as one and are still running parallel ships, what advice would you have for them and how can they make it work? Um, I think it's important that um, the gurus had talked about communication. <clears throat> I think part of that state that you get to when you feel that, okay, we have crossed most of the hurdles is when you are able to approach your spouse to deal with the matter and not be afraid of losing face and not be afraid of feeling lower than you are or feeling stupid or feeling that you have lost something because you have to concede to something where it doesn't matter what it is. You're not afraid to say sorry. You're not afraid to admit that I made a mistake. You're not afraid to be able to tell your spouse that, look, I am determined to make this work. To have that sort of conversation, which could be very difficult, because you could be the person that is hurting, or you could be the person that feels aggrieved, but you need to be able to see your spouse and go and have a discussion. And you have to know how to have that discussion. You don't have that discussion during an argument, or when there's something, you, you know you plan for it and say, let's talk. Things are not going well. How can we resolve issues? Look, I will say this for free. There's no marriage that doesn't have its own storms. Every single one of them that they quarrel at some point or the other. We quarreled seriously this morning. And then I remember that I was coming for life series. <laughs> seriously. And I had to quickly just, you know, find how I was going to retreat. Because I was the one that said some things that maybe I shouldn't have said. So I said, ah, okay, you know what? I've got to make this right. We cannot come here and be fighting. So um, it's not something that would stop. I don't think it would, as you get along, know how to deal with conflicts. You have to be married and to have a successful marriage, you have to be steeped in the art of compromise. It's give and take, give and take. Win some, lose some. And that when you lose, don't think that you have, or when you win, don't think you have won. When you see yourselves as one couple, one unit, nobody loses, nobody wins. Both of you, there's no winner, there's no loser. Both of you lose or both of you win. That's the way to look at it. Okay, I'll allow, um, I call her Dex. That's what I love to call her. When, when things are very good, like now, it's Dex. When there's a quarrel, it's Fadike. <laughs> Mrs. Adekwat, I want you to talk about uh, how you knew yourself at 17 to know that you wanted to date him and how you've evolved as a person and still continue to choose to be 
married to your husband? Because that's the real question there at 17 or 22. You keep changing. How do you now continue being married to the same human being? Well, at 17, I must confess that I didn't know. In fact, I tell people that until I got married to him, I was sure he was not the person I was going to marry. I was so sure because he had roaming eyes. I'm sure you know what that, me what that means. But the truth of the matter is that um, we were kids, we were children. But we, we were friends. I mean, I had, at 17, you know, you're in school. I, he was my, then we called it October Rush. That means that the very first person that started date, uh, toasting you, I don't know what language they use now. He's still toasting. He's still toasting. Okay. He was the first person that came to me in school. I had lots of admirers, if you must know. And, <laughs> so, but I mean, I, he enjoyed my company, I enjoyed his company, and that's all we knew at the time. Then we finished um, university, he finished before me, and it was site youth call, and I also finished site youth call. And it still continued, and we were just, I think we even fused before we married, because we were just, we were just one. So it's not as if I can say that I knew from day one at 17, that this is the man for me. He didn't, even, he didn't even tick all the boxes. But as we now got, when I now finished, and fortunately for me, I mean, God found me quick, quickly, I mean, quicker than he did. So I knew that, despite my trying to even resist, that this was the, that this was the person for me, eventually, and uh, we got married. But I'd like to talk about stepping back from a bad relationship. The thing, when, when a relationship goes sour, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a gradual thing. And that's why communication is important. If you communicate regularly, then you know that, you know when things are beginning to get, go downhill, and you talk about them, you talk about those things. So it's not until it gets it to, the, to the head and one spouse says that, I'm moving out. Before it got to the stage of you're moving out, you must have known that this thing is going, but well, some, some men say that, I'm the kind of person I don't like to talk. I don't like to talk. I, I had, no, you can't, you're in a marriage. So you must talk. So communication is very important. Otherwise, you let it get bad, and then to step back is a problem. So communication, as um, um, Kyle mentioned, is extremely, is extremely important. And we, for the singles, sorry, one minute. For the singles, values. Try and marry a person, someone that has the same values. Not that it stops, it stops um, conflicts, but it minimizes it. Yeah. You have the same values. It's also important. Thank you so much. A rousing ovation for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. We've run out of time. We've even borrowed time from other people, but I think this was an important conversation. Um, and, Ma? We borrowed time. Thank you, Ma. Um, but we just want to say thank you. I'm sure you all took notes or took recordings, communication, being deliberate, being intentional, treating your marriage like a real thing, not just letting the marriage happen. You have to be very deliberate about your marriage and all the other things that come with it. Um, as they go back to their seats, please give them a big, 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 big round of applause.